Hello everyone. In this masterclass, we will have a look at the current state of the KineFX Ragdoll tools in Houdini 20.5. In order to better illustrate the usage of these tools, we are going to use the little bot content library project that Henry Dean and myself completed for side effects quite recently. If you wish to follow along, then please head to the link in the description where you can get the little bot project for yourself. And that being said, let's jump right in. To kick things off, let's have a quick overview over some general concepts related to Ragdoll. First and foremost, what is Ragdoll? Ragdoll is basically a character that we run through a solver, so something that will create a simulation for us, and this simulation will look something like this. It's tr essentially trying to create a physically accurate um, animation out of a set of inputs. Now, in this network right here, we can see we have a Ragdoll solver SOP, and that's been around for a while, so I'm just going to mention it here and then uh, not come back to it in this particular masterclass. But I think it's still a good example to illustrate the sort of the core concepts of, uh, of Ragdoll. So what do we need in terms of data for creating a Ragdoll simulation? Now, of course, we, as I said, we, have, we need a character, which in KineFX land, it's more or less defined by its skeleton, at least in terms of animation. And this is a classic sort of skin effect skeleton where if I drop down, for example, a rig pose, we should be able to see all the joints that we have available and we can select those joints, translate them, rotate them around and stuff like that. So this is just your generic skin effect skeleton. Um, next up, we've got a set of collision shapes. So these are a set of packed primitives, which basically what they do in a nutshell is the moment we have a skeleton, we don't have any volume for our character, and because we're running a physically based simulation, we need some type of volume per you know, limb, per piece, or it depends on your character, so that the solver can actually create the proper collisions and interactions. And this is what the collision shapes are. So we imagine that we're kind of taking the skin of the character, we're kind of dicing it about, and creating convex shapes out of that, which are obviously overly simplified as well, because we want our solve to run as fast as possible and that then can be fed to the solver uh, itself so it can figure out uh, collisions and all of that. And then we just plug all of those into the Ragdoll solver. Uh, one thing I want to mention though is that one an extra bit of data which can't be seen here because it lives on the skeleton is the rotation limits. So if we look back at the result here, we can see that even though our character kind of falls, you know, without any um, any direct animation, so to speak, we can still see that, you know, the, the legs and the knees, they sort of bend in a more or less natural fashion. And this is because the solver knows, or we told the solver, what's the range of motion on each of those joints so that the produced simulation sort of sticks within reasonable ranges so it can produce a realistic animation. And that is achieved with rotation limits. So I can show you here the configure joint limit SOP. And if we come over to the guide geometry and just display rotation limits, we can see our ranges of motion for each joint. So in terms of setting all this data up, we're going to touch on that shortly. For now, I just want to make it very clear what the data, what's the required data for a successful simulation. Okay. So we come back here to the solver um, and here is just a skin that we bone deform so we can see the actual result. You can see that again. Worth noting that the output, even though if I dis display the rectal solver, we see the collision shapes. This is just a visualizer. The actual output of the solver is a skeleton. So we can see that we're just getting the nice sort of skeleton uh, animation out of the solver, which then we bone deform to get our resulted skin. To take things a step further and land into the sort of apex scene animate land, I have here this little setup which is kind of the, the simplest setup for Ragdoll, but running in the Apex Scene Animate. So things have to shift a little bit from pure KineFX land into this sort of KineFX++ land, if you will, where even though we have access to more powerful tools, uh, we need to do an extra little step where we create the necessary data out of our already existing KineFX data. So I'm not going to linger too much on the sort of uh, apex basics because I think that's just outside of the scope of this. We don't have enough time and that's been covered a couple of times. 
I just want to touch on what's exactly going on in this network and how this stuff uh, then gets translated over to Ragdoll. So we can see here we've got a, the same sort of data that I shown before with a skin. We've got the same skin effect skeleton that we've shown before. We've got the same collision shapes that we've shown before. And now the new stuff that appeared here that wasn't there before is the FK rig. So if I open our Apex view here, we can see that we've got an Apex rig here. Now, this might look a little scary if you're unfamiliar with Apex, but let me just say that this is a very basic uh, sort of FK rig. And what exactly it is, is picture it this way. If we go back here to our skeleton, okay, let me put down a rig pose so I can uh, easily explain this. Our skeleton is a piece of geometry with a bunch of points that have a name and a transform and some primitives that establish the connections and the uh, relationship between those points, okay? So basically, if I select the knee and I rotate the knee, you can see that the foot rotates around the knee. That's your sort of, you know, one-on-one -on -one FK hierarchy concepts. Now, in KinFX, that's all you need to deform your geometry and work with, uh, with skeletons and rigs. However, in Apex, we actually need to first get this geometry, we get this skeleton, and turn it into something that Apex can actually make use of, okay? So we can't just use the skeleton as is, we need to convert it basically into an Apex ready rig. If I come back here to the FK rig, all these green nodes are basically the same joints that we just looked at. So you can see that also like all of them are named exactly after the joints or the connections between the nodes represent essentially the primitives that we saw in the viewport and the relationship between the joints. It's just that we are turning a point with a name and a transform into an apex node with a couple of parameters, okay? Then everything that we see up here with the rotation and like underscore T and underscore R are just vectors that can rotate or translate our joints based on our input. So this is stuff that when we animate we just, you know, tell the root joint, I want to rotate it around like Y 90 degrees and something like that. So we just feed the parameter via the parms and that knows to rotate the hierarchy properly. So this is, if you, if you want, think of this as a more powerful and fancy rig pose sort of setup that is meant to be evaluated at a later stage. So we're not expected to animate it here and now on this stash, but we set it up so that we can use it later on whenever we see fit. Okay, and then just for, you know, extra, uh, extra cool bits, we can actually bone deform our skin in the rig directly as well. So we don't have to set, you know, split this up into rig pose and then a bone deform. We just put both the rig pose and the bone deform in the same apex rig. And the moment we run it, it's going to, to work. So once we've got this, all of this data, so this is the data that we need for an, uh, an apex character. The collision shapes is just for ragdoll. So for a pure Apex character, it's enough to have a skeleton and a rig, and then obviously the skin, which is part of your character as in KinFX. We go ahead and pack this. So we put all these different data streams into a single geometry, um, which, you know, we give it names so we can reference it later. Then we create a character out of that. So now our structure looks something like this with a little bot.char, which represents our sort of top level a geometry container and underneath this geometry container we've got all the bits in our character that we care about all right in apex what's super cool one of the many things is that we have access to we can basically put in as many characters as we want on a single geometry stream and animate with all of them at the same time i'm going to skip these notes for now i'm going to go straight to scene animate and i'm going to go into this state and now we can see that we've got our nice fk rig so this should ring a bell it's basically your kin effects rig pose, except we see the skin being deformed at the same time that we are posing our character. All right. So this is your basic, basic apex rig um, built straight from the skeleton. Now, let's remember the rectal part where before, actually, let me just scroll up here so we can see it here. Before <clears throat> we had our skeleton plugged into the solver directly, and that was running, uh, and then we were just bone deforming the result. But now in Apex, because we don't exactly work with a single character anymore, 
we don't have a single input to our fractal. So the input can be anything, okay? So what I mean is if I go back in and I go here to the ragdoll tool or I press C and switch over to ragdoll tool, uh, from the get-go we can see that there's nothing there, okay? Just our character. We have a couple of handles and stuff like that, but there's no ragdoll character that appeared in the state. And the reason for this is that our ragdoll tool doesn't know what, where to fetch the data from, because again, we don't have a single skeleton input, but we can have many characters. So there's two ways to tell Ragdoll where to look for the data. The one, the first one, and the one that's been here in 20 as well, is via the age key. You can see it up here, create Ragdoll character. So I press age, and I will be prompted with a couple of fields to basically just go through and let the Ragdoll know where to look for all the data that it needs. However, a better approach, in my opinion, and something that's easier to, to see uh, is this configure character swap up here. So I'm going to go ahead and unbypass that and select it. This was added in 20.5. Um, it's basically the same process as the H key. It's just that it provides a parameter interface for you and a couple of menus and stuff like that. So it's a bit easier to set it up and you know constantly go back to it and look at, uh, and look at what you've configured. So I'm not going to linger too much right now, but I'm going to explain this uh, at the later example. I just wanted you to sort of get this idea that uh, this is required. The moment I add that and I do a reset, I don't think I had to do the reset, but go back into the state. Now, if I switch over to Ragdoll, we see that something appeared underneath our character. So if I go ahead and play, we can see that we've got our Ragdoll character playing. Okay. Let me go ahead and just clean up a little bit here so we can see it a little bit better. Just offset it to the side. And if I play again, you can see Ragdoll in action. Now, another thing that we are missing compared to the previous example is that we don't actually see the skin move. All right. So why is that? This is because, again, in SOPS, we had the skeleton. Let me go up here again. The skeleton goes into the solver, okay? The solver will solve and create a simulation, and then we get out the same skeleton, and then with that we can do whatever we want, like bone deform uh, our, our skin. However, when we're dealing with apex rigs, things aren't quite as simple. And why is that? Well, think about it this way. If I wanted to put all my animation onto the skeleton, right? So in this case, essentially, it would be to put it on the FK rig, because as we established before, the FK rig and the skeleton are one and the same. If I wanted to put my animation on the skeleton purely, then sure, that would basically be the same thing, because the ragdoll already knows what the skeleton is supposed to look uh, at to run the sim, so it could just write it back onto the skeleton. However, one really cool thing that we have access to in Apex is stuff like complex rigs. So we can have a more complex rig that has, you know, IK, lookats, and all of that stuff. And maybe we want to rag run our ragdoll and write the data back onto our rig, not our skeleton, all right? And this complicates things a bit because we no longer have a sort of a one-to-one -one understanding on where exactly are we supposed to write the data. Because let's, let's get this stuff out of the way. The ragdoll runs on the skeleton, both in SOPS as well as in the Apex tool. So... We give it a skeleton and it runs on that skeleton and it knows sort of based on the collision shapes what to do with the deformations. So we need to create a mapping between the skeleton that we use for Ragdoll and the rig so that when we write the data out, we know how to put it on the rig properly. Now, because again, here is an FK, so it's essentially a one-to-one -one mapping. It's enough to just have a map character with this map by name turned on. And this will just create a one-to-one -one mapping from the FK Apex rig to the skeleton, right? Which will always match because they're basically the same thing, just in slightly different formats. So now if I come back here and I play, we can still see the skin uh, not actually run. But if I come to Ragdoll, I have some options to bake keys or to start recording poses. So if I, let's say, bake, let me go to frame 24. I'm going to select the controls that I want. So all those. And I'm going to hit Bake Keys, and we can see we are starting to get the data passed from Ragdoll onto the controls. Okay, I can also 
essentially do start recording poses and this will just record a dense set of keys over my controls. And now we've essentially converted our ragdoll uh, simulation into actual keyframe data. I can exit ragdoll. I have here a nice uh, layer to this side with my data. So a ragdoll and a base animation. All this stuff I'll explain in a, in a second more in depth. But for now it's just um, as an intro. And you can see here all the keys and our character is running the, the animation exactly like we saw in ragdoll. Okay. So now with the intro out of the way, let's go ahead and look at the little bot project and see how we decided to configure our character for Ragdoll, but this time with the proper, more complex rig.